Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about the whole crash with FTX and Alameda Research here. So let's just dive on in. So before I get started too deep into the details and trying to pull out little bits of information here, first off, I just wanna state this is a great example of failed risk management. Uh, second of off here, I don't have any special insights into these firms. I don't have any special connections or interviews or anything like that. Uh, I've just been going around the internet searching, reading articles. Uh, most of this is going to be based off of a few articles I have read uh, from Forbes and from CNBC. There's also Wikipedia pages for these different institutions as well. But everything I say here is information as of... Let's see, November 14th, which was yesterday when I actually started reading more and more in depth on these issues. So more and more information is going to come out. Um, you know, everything I am saying is based off of what others have written. These are not my personal opinions or views like these facts and pieces here. Now, I will extrapolate a little bit and add some of my personality and opinions on these. Um, but, you know, this is not really like I'm not somehow having some great journalistic approach. I'm not interviewing uh, ex-employees and all that. So Alameda Research was founded in 2017 by a guy named Sam Bankman Fried. I think the name is quite ironic um, because he basically fried a bank, right? He blew up an exchange in a hedge fund here. So kind of like banks. Uh, he goes by SBF though. But in 2017, he founded this company called Alameda Research after he left Jane Street Capital, which is another hedge fund, a prop firm specifically. Um, he also co-founded it, though, with Tara Mac Ale. I think that's how you pronounce that. And as of August 2018, Sam owned about 90% of Alameda Research. So I think that's crit critical to think about here because there is a lot of conflicts of interest in this whole meltdown here and bad decision making and literally no understanding of risk management, or at best, a very, very fractional understanding of risk management. Uh, but the firm specialized in cryptocurrencies using arbitrage, market making, yield farming, and trading volatility. Again, all in cryptocurrencies here. So there is no actual valuation asset behind this. This is just, you know, people making up little tokens and throwing them onto exchanges here. There's really no value behind this. And we'll talk a little bit about the understanding of that in a second. But more specifically now, right, the whole discussion point now is FTX, this cryptocurrency exchange, which was known as the third largest cryptocurrency exchange, um, imploded. It cannot cover its positions. It took tons of money from clients, basically, and it's all gone. It's disappeared. And uh, I think it's important to note, though, that FTX is a cryptocurrency exchange for derivatives and leveraged products here. That's critical. These are high risk products. These are not general like, you know, equities, like, I don't know, you're buying McDonald's and Coca-Cola. Uh, these are super high risk products in and of themselves. And then of course, the cryptocurrencies underlying these positions as well are even more risky on their own. So FTX was founded in 2019, again, by Sam, and I believe another guy named Gary, Gary Wong, I believe if I recall my notes correctly. Uh, anyways, and the headquarter ended up being in the Bahamas. Um, again, Alameda Research was located they eventually moved that to Hong Kong, which we'll see. And again, this is why it gets a little dicey because it's not all based in the United States. So I don't know how the legalities of things are going to end up playing out and how they're going to charge people. Um, but I believe he is currently in the U.S. Uh, FTX, though, again, as I mentioned, is the third largest cryptocurrency exchange. It was created their own token, of course, because who would create an exchange or who would create a hedge fund and just not create their own ridiculous tokens for the sake of it? Uh, but FTX created their own token called FTT. Um, and again, as of November 11th, it filed bankruptcy, which is the entire point of this video. So let's talk a little bit about Sam Bankman Fried here, because as we kind of pointed back here, right, he founded Alameda Research in 2017. He founded FTX in 2019. And as of now, he is 30 years old and an MIT graduate. So he is kind of the core piece of this entire puzzle here. Uh, he worked at Jane Street, again, Jane Street Capital. I have absolutely no idea why people worship people at these, you know, put them in air quotes, these prestigious hedge funds and prop funds and everything. Um, I've met people at these funds. They're nice people. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're average people. Uh, they're average quants is more likely the statement we should make here. But they're not like going to be some crazy rock star who's a genius. And I think that's part of what plays into Sam's kind of allure here, which we'll see. Uh, he also worked very briefly, it seemed, at Center for Effective Altruism, um, 
which is a firm, you know, that's trying to save the world and do great things for great people. Um, so he kind of has that little bit of an edge here too, which we'll talk about. But Sam was known for having a really, really high risk appetite. And as we'll see here as well, there are many employees, past employees saying like, he would say like, we're going to do this. And people would say, there seems to be a lot of risk in that. Maybe we should like step back a little bit, or maybe we should, you know, analyze it a little more. And Sam was like, pedal to the floor, you know, just like, go, go, go. Let's just take on more risk. Let's do more things with that. And again, I think this is what's playing into his personality. People are liking this like, you know, superhero personality. You worked at Jane Street. Um, again, we're going to see here in a second. He has a bunch of donations. So as I put on here on the bottom, uh, he has a high profile because he used a lot of his money and gains um, to give to donations for charity and nonprofits. He also gave a bunch of money to lawmakers and he also sponsored a bunch of sports arenas. So as he's rubbing shoulders with all these individuals, um, you know, his whole goal when he started these funds, he said he wanted to make a billion dollars and give it away to charity. And so who wouldn't just give you money because obviously you're a good person because you want to give money to charity. And, you know, this is kind of the personality perspective. I think this is where it's important to realize this because somebody asked like, who would give, you know, a 30 year old person, even like myself, who would give me $2 billion? Like that seems like a lot of money without a lot of due diligence being done by all these individuals adding money. Uh, but again, it's this personality, right? It went to MIT, must be smart. Uh, it went to Jane Street and worked there for a while, the prop front, must be smart again. Um, you know, he seems to be really confident and he's making all this money. And, you know, as the ball starts rolling here and people start putting money in, more and more people are putting money in and money in and money in. And of course, now he has some money. He's hobsnobbing around here, you know, with all these, you know, lawmakers in Washington, which you can look up and see. Uh, again, giving money to charity and nonprofits. Everyone's like, wow, like this guy's making money, but he's helping everybody else out. This must be a great person. And again, sports teams, Americans love sports. So just naturally people are like, falling all over him like, oh, you know, he sponsors my team, like the Heat, or I believe like the Golden Warriors, Golden State Warriors and whatnot. And more importantly here, I'm going to put a little note here, Sequoia Capital backed FTX. Um, and in return, later down the road, as he's getting capital and funding and, you know, making money and building this hype and getting more and more money, you know, as part of this $2 billion for getting this firm going here, uh, he invested a $200 million back in Sequoia Capital. So, as you should see here, there's a tit for tat going on between him and all these individuals, which I don't know. You start to get into the gray areas on these things. If I paid you X amount, you paid me X amount. I am investing in your firm. You're reinvesting in my firm. Um, again, the lawmaker thing, he tries to claim it's bipartisan because he gave some to a Republican, some to a Democrat. But I have not seen any stances of like, I believe in X and then him doing money to support that cause. It just seems like he's finding individuals to give money to. Um, and again, as all this is going on, uh, he actually went to Washington and talked about, oh, we just need more regulation in crypto space here, right? Uh, we need more of this risk management. That's what we're really doing. And as we're going to see in a second, uh, this is all just show, but he was not doing this behind the scenes at his own firm. Firms. There's two firms in this scenario here, you know, Alameda Research and FTX. So now this is where the conflicts of interest start coming up here. Sam had some issues here. Uh, again, things that banks, for example, would not really allow or they'd be frowned upon if they were, you know, occurring here. Um, but there were some employees, according to, I believe, a Forbes article here, they did some interviews. And these employees were saying, like, Sam ran everything, right? At both Alameda and FTX, Sam said this, that's what the firm did. Sam did this, this is what they did. Uh, Sam had strategies and put things together, that's what they were working on. It wasn't like a decentralized firm where you have a hierarchy where you have like a CEO and then you have people supporting in different areas and their expertise. And then you bring in experts um, to do these different sorts of tasks here. It sounded like from reading a lot of these articles, there was kind of a bros club of Sam was kind of this ringleader. There's a bunch of friends and information was flowing between these small group of people. But it was not flowing to the executives of some of these firms, people that were brought in probably more as like a, I don't know, like the, the golden ticket here of like, hey, look, we have this great, wonderful person over here, like a facade, um, but they aren't really doing a whole lot in the executive side of this. Um, so Forbes even stated that Sam kept high level executives at FTX in the dark about the financial accounting. So not all the financials were, you know, visible all the time. So like people couldn't go in and look at the books. Um, 
at large firms, often you can just contact accounting and they can look at it. Or you have board of director meetings uh, or even executive presentations with the executives in the firm on following up on like the firm's health, for example, even just like quarterly. So you get an understanding of where the money's coming from, where it's going, kind of what issues you're facing. Again, all standard practice for firms that are actually ran legitimately. Uh, now, having kind of a dictator, as it's kind of been stated on a few sites, that just runs the show, uh, everybody just followed him and just fell all over him because, well, he's doing it for charity. Uh, and so, you know, we all want to be a part of this. We all want to be rich as well. You know, Sam's making a ton of money. We would like to make a ton of money as well. And of course, you know, I'm sure everybody at these firms is saying, oh, we're going to give ours to charity too. Um, I highly doubt they would though, but... Anyways, and then on top of this, uh, Sam had an on again, off again relationship partner with a coworker here, and he ended up making her a co CEO at Alameda Research along with Sam Trabuco. So, again, conflicts of interest here as you're having someone you're dating uh, running a firm here. Uh, you know, relationships get messy in general, especially when you're just dating. So, these are things that should have been red flags to investors everywhere. Um, but perhaps this information was not made public. And probably the most scary piece of this entire puzzle here uh, is that, you know, Sam Bankman Fried went on Bloomberg with an interview with Matt Levine here, and he explained that they were making money from yield farming, where they could make a profit from basically a black box and they could squeeze it and just make tons of profit. Uh, and that block, black box that everybody's throwing their money into basically does nothing. Uh, so I've been a massive critic of DeFi as well, against yield farming as well. I debated this at the trading show in Chicago here in 2022. And again, I keep hearing everyone saying, but Dimitri, cryptocurrency has value. It has intrinsic value. And yet I made a video here this last week on intrinsic value. And again, cryptocurrency does not have intrinsic value. You might be able to argue it has financial value if it adds value to some sort of form here. But most cryptocurrencies, most blockchains claim things like transparency and clearly here, these things should have been caught by somebody. Somebody should have noticed this if they were really that transparent here. Um, but the sad part, too, is that, you know, Sam Bankman Fried uh, actually commented back to Matt here at the Bloomberg interview. Basically, when Matt said he made some statement about it, it basically sounds like a Ponzi scheme. And Sam said, yeah, yeah, basically that, that's what it is. Like, he agreed that this is kind of a scam. And yet I see all these young students. I see a lot of graduate programs in universities really pushing crypto because, you know, universities want to get their students employed. Uh, these employees want to be the next, you know, Sam Bankman fried worth billions of dollars. And so everyone's pushing and pushing to run into these areas. And yet there's not a lot of due diligence going on behind the scenes here. And that's when I mentioned, so way back when here, probably the beginning of this year, maybe even last year, uh, I had a podcast episode talking about turning down basically a half million dollar offer uh, to work to a fund that did derivative crypto sell, sales and pricing, just like FTX. And a lot of my concerns, again, came around the legitimacy of doing, you know, derivatives that aren't necessarily licensed to the SEC here. Again, I don't know if FTX was because FTX is much larger and they had, you know, a little bit more bandwidth here and some celebrity prowess here. Uh, but again, it's, it's, you're just, it's a Ponzi scheme of stacking cards and creating tokens and convincing people to give me all of your other currencies that are well accepted, like US dollars. And in exchange, I'll give you this magical token that's price fluctuates up and down based on supply and demand of imaginary money. And we're going to say that we can transact uh, from computer to computer and make accounts go up and down. And we do this technology called blockchain, which helps, you know, prevent people from tampering with it. Um, but hacking happens. And it sounded like two part of this came down to hacking uh, FTX, uh, losing some of their money through a hack as well. Um, so now this leads us kind of to this slide here, right? FTX is kind of sliding. I don't think a lot of people noticed this. But in June, a crypto hedge fund, uh, Three Arrows Capital went under and FTX helped cover their losses with customer assets. So as a customer, you put money into FTX. Uh, FTX saved uh, three arrows capital by using your money to support them. Uh, FTX also bailed out BlockFi and Voyager, which are two other crypto exchanges. Um, I believe Voyager is still on sale, but it sounds like, again, FTX is giving funds to help kind of bail out um, these other crypto firms here. So imagine this now FTX is this golden child. Uh, it's ran by this guy named Sam Bankman Fried. It's genius. It's smart. It's everything under the sun that everyone wants. And magically, all these other crypto firms are failing and struggling. 
because it's not really a valid product here. And now what ends up happening is FTX is acting as the savior to step in and trying to finance all these other firms to keep things supported because the goal being, at least that's what I'm thinking the goal was, was to keep these things up and running as long as possible so that FTX could just gain more and more and more capital to be in a better position here. So again, if parts of the crypto world start failing and sliding off, uh, the issue is most of the other ones are all tied together. So just like the banks crashed in 2007, 2008, uh, when a big firm like Lehman went under AIG, uh, when these firms start going under, everybody's holding everybody else's products here. You're cross-invested because banks, for example, uh, generate a specialized product. Like maybe they specialize in subprime auto or subprime mortgages or something, or maybe they do prime. Uh, they make a lot, a lot of loans in this one area they're really good at. And then they securitize these things and sell them off to all these other institutions. And often when you have large loans, example, you know, for big firms, let's say, I don't know, uh, Lockheed Martin needs, I don't know, I don't know, $200 billion to do some new project. Uh, one bank doesn't want to take all that risk. So what they end up doing is a bunch of banks pitching money on these projects and they all carve out different, you know, percentages of this and they all share this. Uh, so when one bank goes under, uh, all the banks start to crumble with it. This is what's happening with centralized or decentralized finance. This is what's happening with FTX. Uh, as FTX went under, I saw an article that over a hundred crypto firms now or hedge funds or whatnot have all gone bankrupt again, because everybody's interconnected in financial systems. So DeFi is not this magical silver bullet that is immune to, you know, crises and all this stuff. It has all the same issues as centralized banking, but probably even more because there's not a lot of real assets underlying this. So again, this is where FTX is starting to slide here. It's starting to try to bail out other institutions. And then finally, the crash came here. So I have been arguing this and I argue this again at the Chicago Trading Show that essentially the issue is, is that if you're going to use cryptos here and you're going to use blockchain technology and you're not going to have centralized uh, exchanges where there are multiple partners who can absorb losses, which is how the current systems work. Um, and again, there's not, you know, regulations and a bunch of other rules on how much risk each individual can take and all these sorts of, you know, guardrails that keep us all intact. What ends up happening in derivative contracts is, you know, you can't transact instantly. So people in DeFi keep yelling at me, Dimitri, we are transacting instantly. So essentially there is no risk. It's like, yes, but if you do derivative products, essentially you are promising on a price to exchange something in the future. That's the entire premise of a derivative product here. Uh, so you can't prevent this. There's always going to be losses. And the, the claim made against me was, you know, that's true, but they might end up taking the loss, but they have to resettle up like every day. And then what ends up happening is, you know, if there's a so-called count, like default, a counterparty risk default, so the other party can't, you know, settle up, um, then they just, the contract just cancels and goes away because they can't fulfill it. So you're not really out anything. It's like, well, sure, but you still have to roll that contract into another contract now to be able to get the valuation or hedge that risk at the maturity date of that derivative product. So Alameda Research was in this sort of derivative contract here where essentially you have to put up collateral. So for Alameda here, they're in positions which required margin accounts and had to have collateral backing that. But the issue with this is if the prices deviate too far, so say, you know, wheat's selling, I don't know, or Tesla is selling here at $60 and it goes up to like $70, right? That's $10 you're going to need. But a lot of times these contracts are in the millions of dollars. So, you know, if you're deviating, say 10 bucks and now that person owes me a million dollars, there's a probability they might not have that million dollars to fulfill that contract. And if time goes on and now it goes from $70 to $80 and now they owe me $2 million, you can see if the price keeps going up, uh, they're going to keep owing me more and more and more money here. So what we end up doing to hedge this risk, uh, which is called counterparty risk here, as we require each party to put up collateral into a margin account. And when the price fluctuates one way or another way, uh, there's some padding. There's also called a margin call, which is when essentially the price moves too far in one direction. And now that collateral you have is not enough to cover it. Uh, you have to put more money down to cover that position here. So it's a risk management strategy that is required uh, in the way that derivative products are constructed here. But Alameda Research was taking these positions again, because FTX, which is where they're trading here, the exchange itself offers derivatives and high leverage products here. So they're going to require collateral and margin because they're really high risk products. Again, Alameda here though, was using FTT tokens. So it was using the FTX tokens of the exchange as that collateral. Now the issue came when one day the value of FTT dropped 75%. So essentially you have this margin account and let's say, I don't know, it's worth, you know, a million dollars. 
If it drops 75%, it's only worth $250,000. So now that margin call is gonna kick in where they have to put more money down to cover that position, right? They need to have enough money in there. Well, it turns out uh, Alameda did not have those funds. And so essentially they defaulted. So how does this, so now Alameda Research basically defaulted because the value of FTT, which is the currency used by FTX, tanked through the floor. Uh, this gets a little more complicated though, so bear with me on how this is shaking out. Uh, FTX also had a feature called spot margin uh, where users could basically borrow funds from other users uh, and then you'd pay some sort of interest on that amount of money that you borrowed or tokens here, FTT tokens you would borrow uh, to do other trades here. Now, Alameda was using this feature, um, but more specifically what was happening is Alameda was basically taking funds from FTX and using them to cover their positions. So now when we went back a few slides here and we're talking about FTX, you know, is bailing out BlockFi and Voyager. The question being is, so how much money does FTX have and how much money does Alameda Capital have? Because it seems like they are just loaded and just spending money left and right and covering and bailing people out. But there has to be some catch here, right? Money's not free. Um, so one of these issues that came down to it and why FTX then failed on top of Alameda failing was that FTX was not accounting correctly um, on their books. And from kind of sources and reading articles, it sounds like this was somewhat of an intentional decision um, to kind of make things look better than they were. But basically what ends up happening is a bunch of customers provide deposits. So let's say I put all my US dollars in, I put in $100,000. Um, FTX needs to ensure that they have at least enough assets to cover if people want to withdraw. If not, um, right, there's no funds for you to withdraw and then you end up with no cash. Now, accounting wise, what ended up happening with this spot margin is different individuals were actually lending out money to other individuals, other users on this account. They could have been hedge funds, for example. And what ends up happening, as soon as I you know, lend, let's say $10,000 to another individual, now FTX is accounting for that by saying, okay, the amount of deposits we had, Dimitri Bianco had $100,000, uh, but he lent out $10,000. So now he only has $90,000 in the account. Now, the logic behind why this is probably done is they're assuming, okay, uh, if the other individual defaults on Dimitri's loan here, right, so they don't pay that $10,000 back, um, you know, that's too bad. That's just Dimitri's loss, right? That's just his responsibility. So they're thinking, I guess, in a way that they're offloading essentially these loans and products and features uh, and at risk of being offloaded to the individuals doing the lending. Now, Banking wise, I don't believe you can do this because again, this feature is inside of your institution. So those transactions and those loans or those spot margins uh, are all still located inside of uh, your kind of wheelhouse of what should be accounted for here. It's not like they went out and bought something else or I don't know, but it just seems real sketchy on this. And so what ends up happening is, you know, on the accounting, they're looking at it saying, okay, let's say we have, you know, a hundred units on the balance sheet of deposits. And they might say, oh, we've got 200 units of extra capital sitting around, like we can more than clear this. Or maybe they say, oh, we have 90 units. Uh, so essentially, you know, we might not be able to cover 10%, but that's really not that big of a deal. So what ended up happening in this scenario is that FTX actually underestimated the amount of deposits they actually had on book. Um, and they just basically pretended they offloaded to customers here. So this will become a problem as we'll see here, when you go to this slide on Binance withdrawals, which is a competitor of theirs. Uh, so Cheng Peng Zhao, uh, a CEO of Binance, which is a competitor of them, there were some interactions with them in the past as well. Uh, he threatened to sell his FTT tokens, so FTX's currency, uh, which caused some of this crash. It contributed to it. Now, I, I don't want to say it caused that because I don't think anyone actually knows if it caused it, but it contributed to it. And he made this announcement over Twitter which again, where is the SEC on this, right? Elon Musk gets in trouble for announcing things on Twitter. Um, where are the regulators cracking down on Binance and cryptos? And like, you can't just announce public announcements on your Twitter account, your personal account here, or maybe your company account. But either way, like you need to make an official announcement. You can't just willy nilly be dropping off a million dollars off your bucks and getting out of a position. Uh, I would say this is probably not the most ethical way to do this, but essentially this was done on Twitter. And of course, this now causes a run on FTT because people realize there's most likely not going to be enough people to buy those up. 
And that's a great thing for firms. They're going to wait for that price to crash and crash and crash. And then they're going to want to get back in here. Well, the problem with this uh, it goes back to these accounting issues with the the products of you know FTX. If they're not holding enough capital because they don't believe they have that many deposits on file, they don't have the capital to do that. So again, these things are contributing. The value of FTT now is falling. Now there's a run on the bank essentially with FTX. Uh, hedge funds firms can't get their money out, and FTX ends up shutting down the exchange and just freezing everything and not allowing individuals to take their withdrawals out. So. You know, this is like 1930s run on the banks uh, issues here that we've seen in the past. Again, this just comes down to common sense risk practices, better accounting practices, uh, better internal audit practices, um, more transparency, as it seems like from a lot of the articles. It seems like Sam was a little bit willy nilly and loose with, you know, how things were done. It seems like a lot of things were kept in very tight circles of individuals, again, who might not all have been executives. So this starts to create a lot of issues, for example, asymmetric information problems uh, where not all the executives or guessing not all of the board understood all of the risks because again, the CEO being Sam here uh, didn't willingly provide all this information. So it's not up to the executives necessarily to ask for this. You need to just provide this and discuss the actual health of the firm. So that's another issue in its you know, self here is again, there's just not a lot of transparency, which is causing now a lot of issues between these. Um, in that tweet too, though, as well, uh, Ching, Ching Peng Zhao from Binance also mentioned the reason for getting out and offloading that position was because he knew that FTX was in trouble here. So my question is, how do you know that? Is there some insider trading involved in this on the Binance side? Should they be facing charges as well and investigated? I don't know, but that seems kind of sketchy. Like, oh, I just know this firm's not going to do well. I'm going to remove some money here. So I'm guessing something popped up, something came up, maybe there's friends of friends and something got leaked. Um, again, just more fuel on the fire here of the crypto meltdown. And then finally here, I'm gonna cover violations of just basic economics here. So FTX was creating their tokens, uh, which were held privately. Uh, so they were not releasing them onto their public you know, exchange, showing how many there actually were. And it seems Sam thought he could just basically print money behind the scenes to cover all kinds of things. And there was, I guess, and in one of the articles, it sounded like one of the employees mentioned, essentially, he would just buy things with FTT, their currency, FTX's currency, because he would just print and make a bunch of extra currency and just say, oh, my account has an extra $10 million in it. And then they would go out and just buy things and do things and make promises um, on tokens that didn't exist. So why does this violate economic principles here? Again, the United States is facing this right now. Much of the world is facing this. Uh, one of the drivers, but not the only driver of inflation is if there's too many dollars chasing too few of goods or just simply a monetary policy terms. Uh, there's just too many currency pieces going around because it's become worthless as you're printing more and more and more of it. Um, there's no actual value to back that, which is why cryptocurrencies are not intrinsic value. They don't have intrinsic value. There's nothing backing that except for my promise. And of course, your Sam's promise wasn't worth anything uh, for what it seemed. So again, they were just printing tokens. They weren't releasing that to the public here, again, which I believe would be somewhat of a legal issue or at least a moral issue here. Uh, the price of that FTT token being traded wasn't accurate. And again, when this information maybe came out as part of the Binance issue, and you know, there's a lot of things that look like to be contributing to that FTT valuation crash. Essentially, you know, Alameda ended up uh, borrowing funds from FTX, which then it defaulted on, couldn't pay back. Um, so it's kind of a conflict of interest here of Alameda Research using other people's money. Again, if it's part of that spot margin, again, it's kind of in a gray area and kind of an odd issue here, but you shouldn't be able to just borrow people's money and not tell them because it sounded like a lot of people just didn't know that their funds were being borrowed. So just as a quick conclusion on this, um, Alameda Research and FTX were basically ran it sounds like almost solely ran uh, by one individual named Sam Bankman Fried. Um, he ended up borrowing a bunch of funds uh, from Alameda Research from FTX. And then those funds, basically the value of FTX crashed through the floor with a margin call. And when that occurred, uh, Alameda Research couldn't cover its position because FTT, that FTX, that FTX token was basically worth nothing. So, you know, it was kind of this Ponzi scheme of a bunch of money put money in, uh, it seems like Sam printed a bunch of extra money of FTT, essentially these tokens. And then when people went to go get their cash out because, you know, the tokens are crashing and there are other issues, uh, FTX 
as a firm and exchange here didn't have enough capital to cover those positions. So again, Alameda took on too much risk. They ended up defaulting. Uh, the money that was kind of financing and supporting Alameda Research was actually funds from customers from FTX. And FTX basically defaulted as their value crashed and their accounting practices didn't allow them to actually keep enough you know, currency on hand to cover that. So they didn't have enough US dollars to let these people cash out. So now there's a run on the bank because there's no money there. And essentially the whole thing blows up in flames. So anyways, that's what's going on with FTX. Again, guys, this is just stuff I'm piecing together. Check out my sources below if you want more information and more insight uh, from other, you know, journalists and whatnot. But anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.